Okay, so uh, good evening uh, to uh, venerables, uh, brothers and sisters of the Dhamma. Uh, tonight we are starting this uh, two part series uh, on these uh, four sublime states. Um, and of course, to clarify what are the four sublime states, uh, the first one being loving kindness. We just chanted this uh, Karaniya Metta Sutta, so it's on loving kindness, that's the first one. Second sublime state is on compassion. Third sublime state is on appreciative joy. And the fourth sublime state is equanimity. So these are like the four kinds of uh, states of mind or emotions, you know, whatever you want to call it. So these are very useful or essential for cultivation. So it's like the uh, basis, uh, although in Theravada we don't really talk about like bodhicitta, but it's the foundation. You know, before you want to have like bodhicitta, you need to have uh, compassion or loving kindness. Eh? So I'm touching on this uh, <clears throat> a bit of the fundamentals first, um, but before we start, um, we are uh, going to do a bit of marketing. I'm going to tell you the pros of this uh, practicing uh, of these four sublime states. What are the benefits first? If not, people think, oh, yeah, I practice every uh, religion also teach you need to have love, right? Then uh, non religious people also will tell you, oh, love is important. Right? So, what's so special? Right? So, we are going to uh, uh, discuss, at least from the Buddhist point of view, uh, first the benefits. And later on, like how to practice this loving kindness. All right, so uh, we have this thing called the 11 blessings of this uh, loving kindness, the Pali Buddhist Metta. Right, so any of the four sublime states, they also uh, will have these 11 benefits. You can find this in this Metta Nisangsa Sutta. Okay, so the uh, first six. I'm just going to cover one by one. Huh? So first one is uh, person will sleep happily. So because for loving kindness, you wish all beings well and happy. So when you have this happy state of mind, you wish others to ha be happy, you feel happy. And then uh, emotionally, when you're happy, uh, then that will uh, enable you to sleep happily. So the prerequisite is you need to try to do this as long as possible uh, the whole day. It's not like uh, you curse and swear the whole day and you wait for the last moment before you pop into bed. Okay, may all beings be well and happy. Okay, let's sleep now. Sleep soundly. No, it doesn't work like that. How many of you have sleeping issues? Sleep problems? No sleep problems. Uh, okay, so this is not a benefit for you. <laughs> not an incentive. Okay. Um, then the second one is you wake up happily. So if you want, if you can maintain this state of mind, then you wake up happily. You're not grumpy. You're not uh, uh, frustrated or upset, and it won't affect your rest of the day. So normally we say the first state of mind will kind of uh, snowball or like chain reaction will affect. Uh, the mood for the rest of the day also. Yeah? So, uh, if you can sort of uh, set the momentum, yeah? loving kindness, whichever part of the day, you get it in motion and it will just snowball. So, loving kindness is very important. And the third one is no bad dreams or no nightmares. Yeah? So, I put this picture here. Uh, some may recognize, but never mind. Uh, these are from the horror movies. Okay, so um, sometimes people have nightmares. Most of the time, they are mental constructs uh, due to you know, some bad deeds or remorse or guilt you've done throughout the day and they sort of uh, resurface in your dreams. So normally that's the case. Um, and if a person has uh, good thoughts, wholesome thoughts, then the chances of this will uh, reduce. Huh? So eventually you practice and you won't have these nightmares, bad dreams. Okay, then this is for sleep. Yeah. So for those who have sleeping problem, uh, maybe you don't need to take sleeping pill in future. Huh? You 
uh, try this. This is the natural uh, therapy. And uh, next three, next three benefits is got to do with interpersonal relations. Interpersonal relationships. So the first one is uh, dear to humans. So human beings will be nice to you. If you are friendly to them, they'll be friendly to you. Huh? So uh, it's kind of like reciprocating, right? And uh, if you're sort of fierce to someone, uh, very hard for them to be nice to you, right? So this is uh, more like a reciprocating kind of thing. Okay, and uh, next one, dear to non-human. Yeah, so this one is like, uh, you know, some people want to practice on animals. Uh, I do not encourage this just for illustration purposes. Please do not try to go to the forest and try to test yourself, huh? go and find a wild boar or dangerous animal like snakes and say, okay, I want to practice loving kindness. They'll be dear to me. <laughs> and you try to go near them, and then you get attacked or bitten, then uh, you get in trouble. Huh? So uh, please don't try that. Um, so for loving kindness, uh, same thing for animals or spirits or unseen beings or non-humans. If they are in a neutral state and they're just passing by you um, and you don't like step in their territory, uh, generally, if you are like producing good vibes, uh, you should be quite safe. If you have like strong emotions of uh, anger or... Uh, something else, right, and they can sense there's some harm or danger, uh, then uh, it'd be a different story. All right, so that's for uh, non-humans. And uh, to further elaborate, non-humans also include uh, heavenly beings, like uh, guardian angels, guardian deities, heavenly beings, and the deities will also protect the practitioner. Yeah, deities will protect the practitioner. Um, <clears throat> so this one is a bit hard to fathom, but in the uh, heavenly realms, in the heavenly realms, right? There's some people think, "Who am I? I'm not a big shot. Why do <laughs> they want to come and protect me?" Right? Um, in in heavenly realms, we believe they don't have opportunity to do much good over there. Down there, they have no poverty, uh, no hunger, no homeless. So where do these uh, heavenly beings practice charity? Now, how can they practice uh, good deeds? They have no chance to practice charity up there. Everyone can just wish what they want and it will appear, right? So uh, if they want to do good, one of the opportunities in the human realm, human realm. So when it comes to the human plane, who are they going to help? Are they going to help uh, criminals, bad guys? Or are they, good, are they going to help the good persons? Right, so if they want to generate good karma, they'll invest in wholesome people. Wholesome people. Right, so uh, for those who like to go to temple and pray, uh, some people say, okay, uh, this temple I pray, uh, very effective, you know, my wish will come true and stuff like that. Some temple, you no, know, or whatever it is. Uh, I think it's a uh, case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if you have lots of deities who have invested interest in you, uh, then maybe it might work and uh, depends on what kind of deeds you're doing. Uh, and uh, if, let's say, you find that you're not doing much good deeds, then I think uh, those deities may not be the good deities. <laughs> and deities also have good and bad. Huh? So uh, if a person is a practitioner, I mean a very orthodox kind of practitioner, uh, they do good, do charity, observe their precepts, uh, you know, practice meditation, chanting, whatever, uh, wholesome stuff. And these deities uh, will more or less be like your bouncer, like your bodyguard. And there are unseen uh, evil beings also. 
some of them are like uh, predatory in nature they feed off human life force or feed on human flesh or whatever it is so uh, these will protect you some of the deities will uh, may help you in a certain way here or there especially towards your spiritual pursuits uh, they will help you in whatever capabilities yeah so uh, these are the first six benefits okay and the next uh, five next five um, cover uh, neither fire poison nor weapons can touch one so this one again please do not try this at home after you uh, listen to this talk and you think you practice a bit of metta a bit of this compassion and you try okay let's uh, drink poison or try to burn yourself please do not do that uh, it doesn't work like that uh, i think a lot of times it has got to do with translation and interpretation yeah translation and interpretation so one interpretation would be uh, like most people will read it and take it a surface value oh fire poison weapon cannot touch you that means you're invulnerable you're invulnerable yeah so that is uh, one interpretation uh, one of the examples we can always take uh, the Buddha and the, his uh, disciples as case studies, case references. First of all, uh, did the Buddha get injured before? After enlightened, right? He got injured. Huh? So there's this story of this, uh, <clears throat> I think it's a venerable uh, Devadatta, yeah? supposedly the bad guy in the story. He wanted to assassinate the Buddha, you know, to take over his position as the leader of the uh, Buddhist monastic. Um, and he decided you know, to uh, roll a large boulder on top of a hill or a mountain or cliff and uh, try to crush the Buddha when the Buddha was walking underneath. So he did that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the boulder broke into many pieces and one of the pieces injured the buddha's foot yeah? so the buddha got bleeding his foot uh, was bleeding so uh, in buddhism we believe uh, injuring the buddha is uh, one of the heinous crimes that means once you committed this it's like uh, definitely you know, go to hell <laughs> it's a uh, no definite ticket to hell so he committed uh, this atrocious act and uh, no, the Buddha got injured, um, and and the Buddha is supposed to be perfect in uh, loving kindness, you know, sort of perfected his compassion, perfected his loving kindness. So in the Theravada Paramis, you know, the perfections, loving kindness is one of them, uh, <clears throat> equanimity is one of them. So if the Buddha, you know, is supposedly uh, perfect. How can he get injured? And a second instance would be uh, the Buddha's passing away. Right? It is believed that the Buddha passed away due to food poisoning. Yeah, supposedly, yeah, food poisoning. So he ate something wrong and then uh, he had this stomach problem and then his health uh, deteriorated and eventually passed away yeah, at the age of 80. So... Uh, if uh, loving kindness can be a disinfectant, then uh, it will be a miracle. Yeah? So, um, so that's one of the case study. And another one would be this uh, <clears throat> Venerable Maha Moggallana, the left-hand disciple of the Buddha, foremost in uh, psychic abilities, I suppose. Yeah? And he's an enlightened being, foremost in psychic abilities, but he chose to... Uh, receive his karma it is believed that uh, there's this group of bandits that tried to kill him in several occasions and uh, every time when these bandits came with their weapons and all tried to uh, kill him uh, he managed to use his psychic abilities to escape either he teleport or he uh, change to some other form and uh, escape right but eventually he was contemplating, you know, why are these bandits keep chasing him? 
and uh, he sort of looked into his past life his past life and he found out that oh in his past life he has uh, <clears throat> i think poisoned his parents before one of his past lives so uh, that is very serious karma uh, he was like i think in in hell before in a previous life and uh, it's sort of uh, not totally clear nah, this bad karma the bad karma wasn't totally clear so that's why in this uh, lifetime as a monk there's lots of these uh, uh, mercenaries or bandits that wanted to kill him so he decided to accept his uh, karma and uh, he got beaten you know, beaten to death so even though he's an enlightened being his mind is free from anger so it's like a natural loving kindness uh, that also doesn't make one immune eh? uh, or uh, don't let the weapons not touch you so that's the case uh, a few case studies so by this case study we can uh, sort of uh, deduce that uh, this statement cannot be interpreted literally so what it means uh, this fire poison nor weapons cannot affect the mind cannot affect the mind especially if a person talks about equanimity or if a person practices any of the uh, sublime states until the mind is concentrated or uh, reaches equanimity from the concentration then it will not affect the mind yeah so equanimity is about not being shaken so uh, the mind is uh, beyond yeah? beyond uh, sort of uh, touched by this fire poison and weapons so that is the second take um, and the next benefit is mental concentration mental concentration uh, just to see a show of hands from the audience uh, how many of you consider yourself to be a Theravada Buddhist only one okay two yeah, a few huh? okay um, all right we have a few okay so so in uh, modern Theravada Buddhism uh, which uh, relies heavily on some uh, post canonical meditation manual they are quick to uh, brush off this uh, four sublime states as a second rate kind of meditation subject yeah so uh, normally people don't use like loving kindness to enter concentration um, so loving kindness is essential huh? if, if you do not uh, want to use loving kindness as an object by itself it is however still part of the eightfold path noble eightfold path under right thought yeah uh, non-greed non-hatred so non-hatred would be this uh, loving kindness yeah? or compassion so it's essential for whatever kind of contemplation you're using a person can do breath meditation and do it in a frustration frustrated mind they breathe in breathe out then you see their face like constipation like that yeah, so frustrated right so because the mind have uh, doesn't have enough loving kindness so it acts like a roadblock if you have too much aversion you want to control you want to force you want to uh, coerce the mind and uh, you it will be a very painful process whatever meditation you're doing same with chanting a person can chant and you're so frustrated because the mind is not in the right state yeah mind not in the right state not uh, soft enough so you need to soften the mind uh, so once the mind is soft enough then you can uh, enter the state of peace state of calm called concentration yeah so uh, essential very essential for all uh, cognitive uh, attention eh? okay so this is useful and uh, next one is this uh, beautify one's facial expression so again if uh, a person has lots of anger and the face will look constipated eh? and uh, if you uh, have loving kindness you look much better eh? you smile so uh, one good tip after this class 
uh, you save you lots of uh, money from these uh, beauty products and you don't have to <laughs> buy too many beauty products um, naturally if your <coughs> facial expression is uh, better uh, you're more approachable so one of the benefits like from before dear to human beings Imagine if you are lost in a particular area, you want to travel to a new area, you're lost, you see uh, two strangers, one uh, constipated face and one putting a smiling face. Who would you approach to uh, ask for directions? The one with the right? smiling face. Yeah, probably the one with the smiling face, right? So uh, that's the benefit. So if you're doing customer service or you want... Uh, more people to join your group you need to have uh, loving kindness and you need to smile more right improve your business but of course uh, that's not the purpose of practicing loving kindness now, some people have uh, uh, different intention or different agenda when they start to cultivate right? say improve your this uh, improve your <laughs> human relations you want more good friends uh, good uh, good partner in life uh, or whatever it is, right, then they would say, okay, practice loving kindness. Uh, that's not the purpose. Huh? Okay, but these are just the benefits, just to let you know. Huh? Okay, and the next one, uh, peaceful death. So eventually, all of us will uh, pass away. Um, <clears throat> so the last moments um, may be hard to imagine you know, for a lot of people. Some people may think, ah, yeah, no, death maybe still got a long way to go. <laughs> Some people may think like that. Huh? Uh, but every moment it can be a test. Every moment can be a test. Um, but if every moment is too short for you, then at least you can look at the, the moment you sleep. Are you struggling to sleep? Yeah, if, you have, if you're still struggling, having difficulty calming down, then you have difficulties. And also, you know, sometimes in life we face challenges, crises. Can you take it uh, with ease, with calmness, or are you struggling? All right. So if you can't even uh, face uh, these small tests in life, then uh, forget about the final exam. <laughs> it's the final exam. Huh? So if the final exam, uh, you know, especially uh, at the point of death, probably lots of pain probably lots of pain, I presume, lots of pain. Uh, how many of you do like uh, deathbed counseling? Ever meet people in deathbed before? Yeah, some, some scenarios can be very painful. Huh? <clears throat> uh, how many of you work in the medical field? No, okay. Okay, if you are lucky, if let's say you are like sent to like a hospice or if let's say you're uh, like, uh, you know, or sent to home for the uh, you know, last moments kind of treatment, at least you know you can uh, control certain conditions, you know, external conditions. But if let's say you're injured or severely, uh, you know, sustain some injury and you're in some ER scenario, can be more painful. Right? You can't control and say, I want a peaceful lie down, leave me alone. No, the doctors and nurses will rush to you and <laughs> uh, do all the, uh, you know, do all kinds of uh, surgery, all kinds of treatment, do kinds of uh, this resuscitation, uh, shock you and whatever not. Yeah? So uh, last moments can be very painful. Yeah? Uh, so if you cannot be peaceful, and we are still sort of actively alive and we are facing problems you cannot face face it with calm and peace then it's a bit hard so this is a training yeah? so loving kindness you need to train until hey you're okay in all kinds of situation then uh, last moment uh, more or less kind of guarantee okay and the kind of guarantee uh, is the last uh, point um, born in the blissful realm or Brahma realm if penetrating no higher. So the end goal, right, is uh, loving kindness can go higher, right, can reach uh, uh, liberation. Again, 
uh, some Theravada Buddhists will argue, hey, no, la, loving kindness cannot. La. <laughs> uh, I will show you more suttas on that. Um, but then if let's say you cannot go higher in your practice, then at least there's a safety net. Safety net, at least you're in some heavenly plane, uh, Brahma realm. And some people have stigma, you know, some Buddhists have stigma. It must be reborn as human. <laughs> Or, or maybe for Mahayana, I can go to Pure Land. No, I don't want to go to Brahma. <laughs> right? So everybody has like a different uh, opinion. Uh, but whatever it is, uh, you know, having loving kindness is important uh, to uh, have this peace, peaceful uh, state of mind. Okay, uh, so these are the 11 uh, benefits for now. So I'm going to move on. <clears throat> okay. So when we talk about uh, penetrating no higher, so what is the highest? What is the highest uh, these four sublime states can go? So we can refer to this uh, Samyutta Nikaya, uh, 4.62 to 46.65. So each, uh, each particular sutta, right? 6.2 is talk, talking about uh, loving kindness, 6.3 compassion, 6.4 appreciative joy 6 5 equanimity yeah so these are four separate suttas so i just combine in one uh so it's just a short excerpt so the uh cultivation and making much of the idea of uh, these four sublime states two fruits may be looked for even in this very life so it is belief uh we say theravada buddhists are uh, kyasi buddhists we want to quickly reach enlightenment this lifetime huh? Then uh, Mahayana Buddhists are Kyasu Buddhists. They want to perfect everything and uh, become a Buddha. Huh? So, uh, so for Theravada point of view, uh, now if you want to uh, get this uh, graduation in this lifetime, uh, you can witness right this uh, realization. That means uh, arahanship, or if there is a substrate left. That means if there are some defilements left. Uh, a state of non-returning. So Chinese is this uh, San Guo Lohan, uh, third stage of sainthood. Or if not, the uh, highest would be this uh, Arahant, this uh, fourth stage of sainthood. So this one is the uh, practice of the four sublime states. So when the Buddha is around, uh, any meditation object he recommends actually can reach enlightenment. Uh, so this uh, great compassion of the Buddha. Um, even non-conventional meditation objects, uh, things like uh, golden flower. You cannot find this in the uh, 40 meditation objects, but you can find this in some stories, uh, but I won't go into detail. Okay, next. Okay, um, <clears throat> any questions at the moment? If not, I'm going to go through some stories. Huh? Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the story of this uh, thousand arm Kuan Yin. Right? So this is in the Mahayana territory already. Um, most people will be familiar that uh, Kuan Yin, Bodhisattva, uh, sort of like represents compassion. Right? Uh, Kuan Yin is like the uh, uh, probably you know, most uh, prominent in the practice of compassion. And uh, how many of you know the origin story of this thousand arm Kuan Yin? How does this Kuan Yin has a thousand arms? Nobody? Okay, so I'm just going to do a short sharing. Eh? Uh, very uh, sort of useful or important uh, moral of the story to take away. I find it quite interesting. So I happen to come across this uh, origin story it is believed that before Kuan Yin got a thousand arms, so this uh, Avalokiteshvara, yeah, that's the uh, Sanskrit name, I suppose, uh, was residing in the Western Pure Land. So Kuan Yin is the uh, disciple of Amitabha Buddha. So they are in the Western Pure Land. So uh, uh, Kuan Yin is uh, uh, cultivating and one day looking uh, uh, at the hell realms looking at the hell realms and uh, say, ah, yeah, so many beings in hell, huh? so decided to do something because uh, Kuan Yin is practicing compassion. 
So interestingly, uh, he came up with this uh, vow to uh, try to help liberate uh, as many uh, or clear the beings in hell. If not, he even set a condition, if not, if he ever, or if not, he won't reach Buddhahood. So that's like a vow you know, to progress before they reach Buddhahood. So to further sort of motivate uh, this uh, practice and not backtrack from the vow, uh, he added one condition. If he ever regretted this de uh, decision, may he shatter into a thousand pieces. So that's the uh, stipulation. And uh, no, every day he practiced, he did his cultivation, uh, he radiated uh, this compassion to the beings in hell, maybe dedicate merits, you know, whatever they do, and saved some beings from hell. And uh, as the days go by or the months go by, uh, he did a hit count with his uh, divine abilities and do a hit count of beings in hell. And he discovered, oh, yeah, how come there are more and more beings in hell? Huh? How come got more? I saved some already, you know, should be lesser. Then Jalak. <laughs> in this rate, huh? forever cannot become a Buddha already. Oh. Cannot fulfill the vow already. So once he started to regret, then uh, the stipulation kicked in. Huh? So uh, he regretted this decision and he shattered into a thousand pieces. So probably the, the Western Pure Land has a very uh, different physics from this world. And uh, uh, Kuan Yin's teacher, right, this Amitabha Buddha, knew about what happened, quickly, quickly came to the scene and uh, sort of fixed Kuan Yin back. And the new form is the one on the right, supposedly the one on the right, the one with the thousand arms. And you can see each arm is like... Uh, arms at the back, like an aura, giant aura, and uh, each arm has one eye. So it has thousand arms and thousand eyes. So that's a new form of Kuan Yin. Right, so uh, what's the moral of the story? Right, okay, so for me personally, the moral of the story is, uh, if you want to help somebody, and if you set a condition, then they'll be bound to be suffering. You help somebody, they expect something, right? You have an expectation, and the expectation is not met, then your heart will shatter into a thousand pieces. In whatever situation, it can be a relationship, it can be helping somebody poor, and you help and help the person ready, then the person uh, never improve or don't want to help themselves, then it's like, hey, you waste your effort helping the person, then you get so frustrated or whatever it is, right? So, uh, when there's a condition, when you set a condition, then your heart will break. So that is in line with the Four Noble Truth. Uh, when you have craving, expectation, then you will suffer. Right? So this is a very interesting takeaway. So from this story, uh, we are going to move this theme to the next one, which I'm going to introduce this concept of direct and indirect enemies. Indirect enemies. Because a lot of times we think we may be practicing correctly. You may think we practice loving kindness correctly. So uh, instead of wishing all beings well and happy, then you wish, I only wish my parents well and happy, or I wish my good friends well and happy. Right, then for compassion, uh, help this person, uh, so I hope that person will thank me in return. Right, so you have a lot of this kind of practice. Then you can practice for hours and hours, and instead of practicing sublime states, <coughs> you may be practicing something else totally different. You may be cultivating this thing, uh, this uh, indirect states of mind. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you uh, these four things. Okay, so the first one, loving kindness. Uh, is to overcome, right? Ideally, to overcome this thing called anger. But if we practice wrongly, it may become this thing, indirect enemy, huh? this thing called uh, <coughs> personal affection. 
and personal affection. Okay, so to make things simpler, if you look at these three columns, and to make things easier to understand, this middle column, we call this the middle way, middle path. Then on the left is one extreme, on the right another extreme. Yeah? So the left extreme is anger, aversion, aversion. Then this extreme is greed. So anytime you mix this with greed, then you get this. You mix this with anger, then you get this. All right, so this is the, the concept. Huh? Okay, so loving kindness um, ideally is to wish all beings well and happy. Uh, this is like originally in the teachings, but uh, nowadays uh, we have like uh, more and more like uh, modern uh, versions, uh, either post canonical writers, they write their own version in it, or, or sometimes like you hear this, uh, this the chant of metta, the music, and you, you start to slowly have things like, uh, may I be well and happy, and you start to have, may my parents, may my close friends, may neutral parties, and stuff like that, and followed by your uh, enemies, be well and happy, right? So that is like more of the modern version, modern version. Yeah, but in the original teachings is uh, you wish all beings well and happy. <clears throat> and uh, anger, I believe you all know what is anger. Uh, that means you dislike or you hate somebody, something that is anger. Then you have this uh, very frustrated, uh, maybe constipated uh, kind of look or state of mind. So that's aversion, eh? anger. And indirect enemy will be the one with strings attached. Somebody close to you, uh, we call personal affection, maybe you find a certain uh, animal or pet very cute, you like it very much, uh, or maybe uh, to a certain degree, you know, your family members and stuff like that, or your friends. So there's some kind of uh, uh, greed, all right? And if a person were to apply the so-called uh, modern uh, version of the loving kindness, you start to wish uh, yourself, then your friends. And imagine if your, let's say your social media have thousands of friends, then you might be spending the whole few hours uh, wishing all your friends uh, well and happy. Then you'll be spending time uh, cultivating personal affection. Okay, so we can do a short experiment. Huh? First, you... Uh, uh, wish your close ones well and happy and you take note of this emotion can you observe can you take note of this emotion okay so this is one kind of emotion then next you wish all beings well and happy is there a difference Right? So it's a different emotion altogether. Yeah? So uh, if you can already wish all beings well and happy, why don't you start off with there? Right? So uh, that's the point. So um, a lot of times when people, you know, I, mean, uh, I mean the ordinary sort of uh, nominal joystick Buddhists uh, that go to temples, um, when they take the joystick and start to pray, What's the first thing they wish? They wish themselves ping an, yeah, their family, uh, peaceful, harmony, and stuff like that. Right? They are cultivating also. Yeah? They are cultivating this one. Yeah? How, many, how many people you know of uh, wish all beings well and happy? Yeah? Hardly I know of. <laughs> Hardly I know of. Yeah? So normally, you know, they wish uh, you know, their close ones success in their business, good health, and stuff like that. So that is personal affection. So if a meditator were to do the same thing, <clears throat> then they are no different from the, uh, you know, joystick praying. All right. So uh, just to let you know, huh? so uh, middle path, and if it's tainted with some. Uh, Greed, you know, some affection, then you have this personal affection, no longer loving kindness. Eh? Okay, then we move on to the second sublime state, 
uh, we talked about earlier, compassion from the Kuan Yin story, right? So compassion is to uh, wish all beings, may they be free from suffering. And uh, if you want to include the whole chant, free from oppression, disease, illness, and stuff like that, right? basically free from suffering. Okay, and <clears throat> um, the idea of compassion is to overcome this thing called cruelty. So cruelty is to wish beings pain. Yeah, you wish beings to suffer. So this is cruelty. So you like to torture people and stuff like that. So that is cruelty. Yeah? Okay, and um, if compassion, you know, practice wrongly, you add some uh, conditions, then it becomes passionate grief, becomes upset, becomes uh, depressing, uh, sometimes you may hear uh, social workers or medical frontliners, they get burnt out. And they feel the pain of their victims, the pain of their patient, and they try to I'm help vulnerable. and help. Sorry, yeah. this is Jill. Can I ask some question? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like what you say, uh, some of the healthcare members, like they get upset. Is it because they get too personal with it? Uh? Yes, that's right. Uh, ah. They end the uh, personalization. Yeah? When, uh, if it's not the middle way, you add the personalization inside, then you'll get affected. You, you get ups and downs with the, the situation also. Even though yeah, okay. you're not uh, in poverty, you're not in uh, illness, you're not facing difficulties, but emotionally, you know, you're as though you are facing it. So some people say this empathy. Uh, actually, empathy don't need training. Eh? Empathy is different from compassion. So uh, mundane compassion or empathy would probably be this uh, passionate grief. Yeah, when you are facing a situation, somebody in trouble, you try to help the person, and uh, if you get affected emotionally, mentally get affected, and that is passionate grief. Yeah. So uh, the uh, middle way, supposedly middle way, ideally shouldn't be affected. Yeah. Ideally, you help the person, not that you're cold-blooded, not that uh, uh, no, you help and you're cold-blooded and you ignore what happened to the person. No, you help the person, you do your task, but you won't get depression. Imagine, you know, Kuan Yin get depression or Buddha get depression, help people. And something is wrong really, right? So, uh, compassion practiced in the middle way with uh, wisdom will have some stability. You won't be affected. So, um, in line with the Four Noble Truths, uh, we define First Noble Truth as suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain. So if you help person and you get yourself into sorrow, lamentation, depression, and pain, uh, then that is you yourself suffering. Yeah, you yourself suffering. So this passionate grief. So you know some people do until practice compassion is so sad, so sad that they cry. Um, there's a chance um, they're entering into this territory. Yeah. Uh, you look at the Kuan Yin expression. This story I heard from another monk. Eh? So some people say they go to Kuan Yin temple and they pray. And when they pray, you know, then <clears throat> they ask for, uh, you know, to solve the existential problem in life, you know, maybe in pandemic or economic problem, whatever it is, or relationship problem. Hey, Kuan Yin, help me. Lah. You know, I got this problem, that problem. Then they look up the Kuan Yin. They say, hey, Kuan Yin smiling, eh? Kuan Yin smiling. Hey, Kuan Yin, uh, I, uh, you, can you hear me or not? You see, I don't hear so much suffering, then why are you smiling up there? Huh? Uh, so next time, they must uh, play this uh, tape recorder, tape recording, uh, this Kuan Zhi Zai Pu Sa, Xing Shen Poro Poro Mi, uh, uh, they have to see these five aggregates as empty. 
then they end all the suffering. So by right, nah, if you practice compassion, you should have this kind of expression. You don't see Kuan Yin pulling a long face. If Kuan Yin pulling a long face, then uh, I think something is uh, uh, wrong with uh, our practice. Eh? <clears throat> okay, so uh, ideally, you know, when you practice, we should get out of suffering. Yeah, so uh, conventionally, we can do our task, but it's not easy to be like Teflon, the mind not affected. So this one requires some training. Eh? Okay, then the third one is this uh, appreciative joy. Appreciative joy. So basically, it's to uh, <clears throat> rejoice in the accomplishments of sentient beings. Or in our chanting, it's to uh, uh, wish may all beings not be separated from what they have achieved. So that is the, you know, the Pali kind of definition in our chanting. And... Uh, whole idea is to overcome jealousy so that is appreciative joy yeah so this for this practice and sometimes if you uh, <laughs> mix with uh, some strings attached then it becomes exhilaration no longer appreciative joy things like uh, you're happy for your friend getting promotion or your your you rejoice in I don't know, the recent SEA Games uh, winning of some medal or from your country, right? So you feel happy. Nothing wrong feeling happy. But if you equate this to rejoicing, then how about, do you rejoice in all the other teams winning medals? Think about it. Or if let's say uh, somebody you know of, your close friend or whoever, win a lottery, strike a winner 40, eh? or whatever it is, win a prize, lucky draw. Then how about those who lose? Do you rejoice for them also? Right, so again, there, there's some terms and conditions. So this is called exhilaration. Eh? There's certain uh, restriction, no longer boundless. Yeah, no longer boundless. So same with compassion. <clears throat> How do we practice boundless compassion? If we were to just look at, let's say, example, a certain scenario for poor people, yeah, compassion for poor people. How about rich people? You have no compassion for them? How about those who are starving? Yeah, you have compassion for them. And how about those who are not starving? They are eating in a buffet, uh, in restaurants, people are eating there, do you have compassion for them? Right, so to, to practice compassion for all beings or loving kindness or appreciative joy or whatever, we, uh, at least for my routine, uh, we break down to the common lowest denominator. All beings are made of the five aggregates. Earlier on we talked about this Heart Sutra, right? Uh, all beings are made of five aggregates. All beings are made of these elements. Yeah, so uh, when they cling on to these aggregates, they will suffer. So in this case, rich people also cling on to aggregates while they suffer. Right? So if you define suffering in that sense, then you can have boundless compassion. And you can have all the boundless things. Yeah? Boundless okay. living kindness, same. All beings are made up of all the five aggregates, all the four elements, right? Earth, fire, wind, water elements. And when you detect these elements in your meditation, or at least you feel in your body, or if you radiate outward to other sentient beings, and as long as you can perceive a form, you can uh, feel the heat from other beings or you can imagine the image from other beings, then you can have loving kindness to all beings. But they, but they, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I think there's something that is on your camera that is blocking your face. Oh, that's my microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, microphone. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so no worries. Uh, you want to see my face, I can move further from the microphone. 
Okay. Yeah? Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, where was I? Okay. So now we're talking about the common lowest denominator, which are the five aggregate aggregates or the four elements. So these are the components that made up sentient beings, right? So appreciative joy, the same thing. Um, every time we, uh, see here, smell, thing, taste, and touch. If let's say we do it with a wholesome intention, then that is worthy of rejoicing. Worthy of rejoicing. Right? So every time we experience uh, a new contact, we gain new experience, that is worthy of rejoicing for all sentient beings. Huh? So uh, lowest common denominator. If you want to go into detail as a particular scenario, then you have duality. Then you have duality. Then uh, we talk about uh, those who win, those who lose, how, how to rejoice to those who lose, right? And uh, you have some problems. Okay, and uh, that is for inner practice. Huh? This is for mental practice. But in daily life, you will encounter all these external things, people who win, lose, gain, loss, that kind of stuff. But mentally, you need to do this <laughs> to maintain sanity. If you go too much, then you yourself suffer. You yourself get caught up in the five aggregates. You get pulled away by the, uh, the sea. And you, you can't swim across to the other shore. You get dragged away by the ocean, by the tides and the currents. Yeah, so uh, uh, you want to stay afloat, stay in the raft. Uh, you need some balance. Okay, and what is this balance? We call this thing called equanimity. Equanimity is a stable mind. Um, so the Pali chant or the reflection we normally use is the reflection on karma. So all beings uh, are the owners of their actions, uh, heir to their actions, whatever good and bad that we do, we shall become the recipient. Something along this line. So this is um, for equanimity. Yeah? So the whole idea is, uh, I think, a lot of religions more or less have this kind of reflection. If let's say they believe in uh, in a god, then it's in God's will. If they say it's uh, they believe in destiny or fate, then they, they talk about destiny or fate. So the whole idea is to uh, have this equanimous mind, not affected when things change, right? So the uh, this equanimity is overcome this thing called restlessness. So when restlessness means you have uh, worry also. When there's ups and downs, then you get restless, you cannot calm down, you worry, you panic, you have anxiety. So this is uh, restlessness. Eh? And uh, if you practice wrongly, equanimity, that means you have callousness. So in uh, local lingo, we call it bochak. Or you don't care. Heck care, right? So some people, they go for retreat and they think they have equanimity, right? They have no more tasks to do, very quiet environment, meditate, right? No chores, no tasks. They're very peaceful, right? Very calm, very still, the mind, right? And you think you have equanimity. Then you end your retreat, go back to your normal life, everything gone. So you, it's not equanimity. Maybe you only have colorlessness. When you're avoiding tasks, right? Avoiding tasks, there's colorlessness. So one, one example I will give is, uh, if let's say a person faint and fall on the ground and you bow chop, you don't want to help the person. Then there's colorlessness, right? But if a person actively help a person, they can have compassion and equanimity at the same time. <clears throat> if let's say you are uh, have some uh, practice, All right? Any questions at the moment? I don't want to go too deep. I leave some time for Q and A. I think I shall end uh, the sharing for today. Eh? Uh, Chifu, um, Ju, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Also, uh, can I say the miss we one must always have a uh, awareness and mindfulness when they are, you know, uh, doing something. So, 
Yeah, um, the, the awareness and, and mindfulness, uh, to be specific, is either you're uh, aware and mindful of these meditation objects or you're mindful of impermanence. Somewhere along these lines, not not mindful of your environment, mindful of the stock market, uh, mindful of okay. the weather. No, yeah, not thank okay. you. Yeah. If anyone have any question, you can unmute yourself and ask Bunty. So can I end my screen share or do you still need to refer and look? Uh, it's up to you. <laughs> Bunty, yeah. Okay, those who can want to look and let you look. We can end my screen share. Stop screen share. Bante, I have got a question. Okay. Uh, pertaining to this compassion early on, you mentioned uh, for the rich, because um, compassion for the rich, because for me, I find that it's only when a person needs help, then we help. Otherwise, we don't need to help. And yeah, then, then why do we need to have compassion for the rich? Okay, All right. So talking about uh, helping people when in crisis, that is practicing uh, dana, practicing dana. Yeah, giving your your service. But in terms of uh, mental cultivation, bhavana, mental cultivation, uh, it's the middle path. So you are supposed to uh, ideally, you know, uh, have a boundless kind of compassion. All beings will face dukkha. When they see, hear, smell, think, taste, and touch, they will cling onto those aggregates. So, no offense, huh? so I, I just want to ask is like, um, so when we radiate meta, it's better to do it in the six directions rather than to any individual? Yeah, ideally, to, to all beings straight away. Yeah. Yeah, so in the next uh, lesson, I will show the uh, this Karaniya Metta Sutta, although we've chanted already, uh, so I'll, I'll go through the, the English uh, translation like in detail. Yeah. Thank you, Bante. Okay, no problem. All right, anyone else? Uh, I see someone in the chat. Oh no, okay, that's have a Hi, Bante, okay. I have a question. Now, may I ask how does sending out, for example, good wishes or good vibes to another person works? Is it like there's a transfer of energy so similarly, if, for example, there are people who like to, uh, for, for example, colleagues who like to look for me to complain because they find that I do not talk much. I find that a lot of them like to kind of call the grievances. So um, like you're mentioning not to hold on to their grief and to be involved into it. Yeah, so how does this work? Is there like some energy flow if we want to send out good wishes to them? Okay, um, fundamentally, or, or at least at the, the basic level, or the primary uh, level, the essential thing of practicing uh, the sublime states is to overcome our own suffering. Yeah, it's in line with the Four Noble Truths, it's not to end other people's suffering. <laughs> yeah, so to end other people's suffering, need a special skill set. So this one you can look for uh, maybe Mahayana speakers. Huh? They have uh, lots of vows, you want to learn certain skill. Uh, let's say if a person, uh, uh, example, huh? if let's say they want to have, they have uh, great compassion or affinity to let's say uh, uh, autistic people, example. They want to help autistic people. Then they need to learn skills. Oh, what do autistic people face? They must attend workshop. Uh, know how to uh, uh, relate to them, how to communicate with them, uh, then you have the skills to uh, help them. Yeah? It's not like uh, you straight away, I wish to help all sentient beings, then you know everything really. No, not like that. Uh, you need to be specific. Yeah? So you need to uh, gather uh, in a certain way some conventional skills, mundane skills to help uh, certain groups of people. Yeah? So like uh, the Buddha is supposed to like know everything, even if he never learned in this particular lifetime, he can recall past lives. <laughs> His past lives, he helped you know, so many. Uh, he'd been in different uh, positions before, different occupations before, uh, different uh, realms before, so he can help uh, a wide variety of beings. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. 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 Yeah. Thank you,
right? So when we send out, may everyone be well and happy. So this is also a positive vibe going out. Um, in a way, a small, small extent, uh, we treat this as a secondary level. Uh, we don't have, uh, we don't add the expectation. It will change the external outcome, right? Mm -hmm. Because once you have an expectation, then we will shatter to a thousand pieces. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so primarily it's to, uh, you, you see for yourself, uh, does your uh, greed increase or, or your hatred increase or decrease? That's the whole idea. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, uh, anyone else? No questions. All okay. Okay, we can uh, go for a short uh, break, maybe like five minute break. Then uh, we can come back and we do a bit of practical, yeah? See how to apply this in uh, practice. There's no point go through, uh, go through the theory. Uh, do a bit of practice and hopefully you can uh, uh, keep the momentum going in your daily life. Yeah? Okay, okay, so I'll see you back uh, in five minutes' time. All right, we'll see you by day. Okay, all right. Hey, what are you saying? Huh? What's it?
Okay, it looks like the uh, timer has sounded. Let's see if everyone's back. Okay, uh, for those who are taking part in the meditation, uh, make sure you are seated comfortably, make sure your back is upright. Okay, so we are doing the uh, abridged version and uh, not the full version uh, due to time constraint. Don't want to keep hold you all too long. Um, so what we are doing is we are going to uh, start uh, wishing all beings in front well and happy. Yeah, no need to visualize and eh? just wish all beings in front <clears throat> well and happy. And we come back to ourselves and we wish all beings behind well and happy. And we come back to ourselves and we wish all beings on the left well and happy. And we come back to ourselves and we wish all beings on the right well and happy. And we come back to ourselves. Now we wish all beings above well and happy. And we come back to ourselves and we wish all beings below well and happy. And we come back to ourselves. So this time round, we are going to wish uh, the entire body well and happy. And what we are going to look out for is uh, the sensations of the body. We call this uh, mindful of the four elements. Right? Earth, fire, wind, water elements. Uh, nothing magical about them. Uh, Earth represents the hard and soft sensations, fire is hot and cold sensations, wind is fast, low movements, and water moist or dry. So the whole idea is uh, not to control or deliberately create them. Yeah, we are not uh, trying to be an airbender or anything. Uh, we let them arise naturally by itself and when it arises we wish them well and happy. So first trying to understand uh, what is this four elements and the five aggregates. So this is your real-time evidence, no imagination, these are uh, observable stuff happening real-time.
Okay, so when these elements appear, these are the form aggregate, yeah, there are five aggregates in total. So the sensations, earth, fire, wind, water, they make up the form aggregate. So when they appear, you just wish them well and happy, yeah? And together with this form, there's also feeling. You may find them comfortable, nice, pleasant, or un uncomfortable, unpleasant, or neutral. So this is the feeling aggregate. And together with this sensation, there's this perception. You'll give a name, give a label, you call this the earth element, the fire element, so on and so forth. Yeah, all the labels and jargons you've learned in the past, you'll try to uh, make sense and cognize your experience. So this is perception. And uh, that's the third aggregate, perception. Fourth aggregate is uh, mental formations. Every time this sensation appears, this is called formations. How is it formed? Where does it come from? So the moment it arises and appears, that is formation. And consciousness is basically your attention. So if you are hearing my voice, that is using your ear consciousness. If you are feeling the sensations of your body, that is using your nervous system, that is your body consciousness. So wherever you place your attention, there will be these five aggregates. So when these elements or these aggregates appear, we wish them well and happy. The whole idea is repetition, they appear well and happy, you can observe a new one well and happy. So we're actually training this uh, spiritual muscle, eh? because a lot of times we let these five aggregates drag us around. We are not paddling the raft. So the current will bring us here, bring us there and we cannot reach our destination. So this uh, come in the form of daydreaming, stray thoughts, worries, and stuff like that. Yeah? So once we autopilot and do nothing, then that's it. The aggregates will sweep us away. So the whole idea is keep paddling, well and happy, new sensation, well and happy. If you find your mind uh, relatively calm, and we treat this like a baseline level. So next we are going to wish all beings in all directions, well and happy, above, below, and all across. No need to push your attention, let it extend naturally by itself. And uh, no need to purposely visualize any sentient beings yet. 
uh, there's no way to visualize all sentient beings, yeah? especially the unseen sentient beings. So we let the mind extend and it will naturally encompass all sentient beings along the way. However far it wish to extend, then that will be your universe. And within that field of attention, we are going to do the same thing. Any sensation arise, can be near or far, large or small area, doesn't matter. As long as you detect something, we wish all beings well and happy. So this time we change the phrasing a bit. We add the most two important words, may all beings be well and happy. When you detect a new sensation, you wish all beings well and happy. New sensation arise, wish all beings well and happy. So the more loving kindness you generate and the calmer the mind should get. And whatever you experience, no matter how uh, calm or how peaceful or enjoyable, whatever it is, uh, emphasis is on sticking on the paddling. Eh? You wish all beings well and happy. Don't get carried away by the currents. You can take note. You can be aware of the surrounding. I mean the emotional aspect but uh, not to fight not to cling on to it not to reject but the emphasis is on to uh, paddling the middle way So this is using loving kindness to cultivate some calm and uh, next we add some insight uh, that is to reflect all beings it will eventually arise and pass away so all these uh, formations all aggregates arise and pass away every moment So when you detect a new sensation, then you reflect on impermanence. How it arises, how it passes away, new sensation arising, passing.
So along the way in the process, if there's any tension or stress, uh, that means something is wrong. Uh, there shouldn't be any kind of tension. In fact, uh, it should be more uplifting, either more happy, more joyful, or more peaceful. And uh, whatever emotion you experience, no matter how nice, uh, same thing, emphasis is, is on impermanence. Keep uh, paddling the middle path. Everything else is just passing sceneries. So this uh, loving kindness with some insight will already produce uh, some kind of stability or some equanimity, no more uh, happy or joyful kind of emotion yeah? once you have some impermanent, impermanence there. Uh, then we move on to this uh, compassion. Yeah? So for compassion, we wish all beings, may they be free from suffering. So like mentioned, uh, no need to over imagine or speculate any scenario. We are going to use uh, lowest common denominator. Uh, any sensation you detect, uh, these are aggregates that are subject to clinging. So every time you detect something new, you wish all beings, may they be free from suffering. So a new sensation arise, wish all beings free from suffering. New sensation arise, all beings free from suffering. Because once you start to visualize only, then you put yourself into the picture and you yourself will face the ups and downs of the tide as well, of the story. And sometimes it's very hard to pull out of the story. Yeah? You have many dramas and episodes and series and uh, end up uh, not paddling. Every time we apply right thought, we wish all beings free from suffering. We are cutting off from this story. Eh?
Okay, so the more thoughts of compassion you have, then it will uh, create a certain sense of calm. And that calmness uh, with uh, compassion or the concentrative calm through compassion should have some kind of uh, happiness or joy inside. It is not total depression or sorrow. And next we add some insight which is this uh, impermanence and how to truly overcome this clinging and suffering and that is to practice detachment so every moment we keep observing impermanence so all beings uh, go through this arising and passing all formations arise and pass away all the time We keep observing impermanence, impermanence, impermanence. As long as we are still uh, in this shore or somewhere in the ocean, they're still uh, arising and passing, uh, still affected with uh, afflictions. So sometimes we'll meditate on the ah, the more the impermanence, they think the mind's so calm, and think there's no more arising and passing. Uh, still quite far, huh? quite a long journey. So uh, even though you think it is very calm and peaceful, you can challenge yourself, can you detach further? Uh, keep observing impermanence, arising, passing, arising, passing. So this is using uh, compassion to cultivate a bit of concentration and insight 
So next we move on to this appreciative joy. So we kind of rejoice in the accomplishments of all sentient beings. Uh, again, no need to over-imagine or speculate any scenario. We are going to the common denominator. Uh, any uh, sensation that arises that you can detect, uh, you gain new experience. And if it's a wholesome one, you have good thoughts, then you can rejoice for all sentient beings. So all sentient beings also will uh, come to sense contact with sense stimuli and they gain your experience. So you experience something new, then rejoice for all sentient beings and detect something new, rejoice for all sentient beings. And uh, this using appreciative joy to cultivate some calm. And next we add some insight. And we're going to reflect uh, all beings will eventually be separated from all that is dear and appealing to oneself. So all phenomena arise, pass away. We don't own them come and go, so every moment arise, passing, arising, passing. No need to over-imagine, eh? 10 years down the road, I'll lose this, lose that. Uh, you just observe every moment, elements, all the particles arising and passing. The joy or happiness from rejoicing start to disappear. That is very normal. Yeah? As long as we cultivate impermanence, the detachment will sort of uh, lead one to an equanimous mind. So whatever emotion you experience again, always mindful of impermanence.
and the benefits of uh, this sublime state so you lead one to concentration easily And uh, we are moving on to the fourth sublime state, which is equanimity. Yeah? So even though some of us already experienced some equanimity here and there, uh, this is another ground-up approach of uh, cultivating equanimity. Uh, so we are going to reflect on karma. All beings are the owners of their actions, heir to their actions, Whatever good and bad that we do, we shall become the recipient. So uh, no need to over-imagine or speculate in the past. I've done this or that, or in the past life, I've done this or that, so I'm going to get this retribution. Uh, no, uh, so we're going to just observe here and now sensations, if they arise and it's a pleasant feeling, that is good karma's ripening. If you have unpleasant feeling arising, that is bad karma is ripening. And if it's a neutral sensation, then that's neutral karma is ripening. So in short, all experiences are conditioned by karma. So you experience something new, karma, new phenomenon arise, karma. So the more you reflect on karma, there should uh, be a byproduct emotion called equanimity. Uh, it's a neutral uh, but refreshing kind of emotion, no joy, no happiness. So if you have a neutral feeling but uh, sleeping, that is not equanimity, eh? that is, uh, you can call it callousness. Okay, so next we add some uh, insight and we are going to reflect how to overcome these karmas. Yeah, sometimes good karma ripen, we feel happy, bad karma, ri bad karma ripen, we feel sad. 
So emotion up and down all the time, uh, mood swing. Uh, so when to overcome this issue, we need to uh, reflect on impermanence. So all feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, they are arising and passing all the time. They keep changing. They're always impermanent. And uh, before we end the session, uh, use the gentle reminder from the Karaniya Metta Sutta, the one we chanted earlier, one of the paragraph mentioned, if we can maintain this uh, boundless uh, loving kindness or this sublime state, be it standing, sitting, walking or lying down, then this is the highest uh, conduct, highest practice. And uh, with that, we can gently open our eyes. So open eyes doesn't mean, okay, the end, back to square one, no. <laughs> Keep uh, generating positive thoughts. That is every moment meditation. All right, uh, I think we have five minutes uh, Q&A. Any questions? problems or interesting encounters all okay or the mind too quiet really too peaceful huh? no uh, yes I, I feel yeah. the inner peace okay yeah that's uh, good anyone else yeah Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask a question um, about this song, Meta Chan. Okay. Yeah, is, is it, uh, does it help to, if you listen to this, is it a uh, proper sutta and does it, it help? It's not from a sutta. Yeah, it probably later works. Oh, uh, is it help to cultivate the Meta. Uh, it, it produces nice feeling, uh, but is it meta? Uh, you can compare, you know, when you wish all beings well and happy versus listening to that sound, then you see what's the difference, law. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Mante. No problem. Anyone else? Dante, I have a question. Um, yeah. do, okay, for the radiating of Meta, I come to the of um Mudita. I'm like lost. I, I don't know what I should do. Maybe uh, yeah, can Bante. The economy is okay, but come mm. to autistic joy, 
it, I, I don't know what I can, I, I can't follow from there. Um, meta was fine, compassion was fine. And one okay. thing I want to ask, like for meta, right? When you talk about the direction, does it matter whether we go for right direction or left direction first? Because it's above, uh, it front, hmm. back, and then left yeah. and right. Can it be right and left? Does it matter? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. It's just a, a spatial familiarization first. Yeah. Okay. Eventually, but, you want to encompass uh, all all directions. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Yeah. But yeah, I'm lost in the Murita side. Thank you, Bante. Yeah. Okay. So so again, uh, Murita is to uh, uh, either rejoice or have appreciation, something like gratitude. So when you gain something, you re rejoice, or you can have gratitude. It's the same. Uh, it produces the same effect. So rejoice is to uh, overcome the jealousy. You know, so other beings. Uh, they gain something, then you feel happy for them. Yeah, so when we detect a uh, new sensation, uh, all beings will detect new sensations, so they gain new experience. So we sort of rejoice in their experience. Okay. Yeah. Or we can be grateful no, for whatever we can experience now. Hey, anyone else? Okay, if nothing, then uh, we can do the concluding chant. And we still have next week, huh? so you can brainstorm and reserve your questions for next week. <laughs> 